everyone loves TV Dad. On the next TV Dad, presented by Progressive, TV Dad explains becoming a man. Son, it's time we had the talk. Okay, TV Dad. You know, drivers who switch and save with Progressive could save hundreds. Oh, is that why my voice is changing? That's a question for your health teacher. <laughs> Listen to your TV dad. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive could save hundreds. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Potential savings will vary. This is Things Police See. First hand accounts with your host, Steve Gold. Welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm Steve Gould. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you for joining us. If you're new, thank you for finding us. And if you're if you're a fan, thank you for coming back. Um, right off the top, I want to thank um, Corbett Investigations for being our sponsor. Check them out at uh, coldcaseexperts.com. Tim Corbett and his team are uh, experts in their field of cold cases, and all things investigation. So if you need that kind of service, um, go ahead and reach out to them. Uh, also, I have a shout out to Jake Pinedo, um, Patreon supporter of the show, friend of the show. He reached out to me uh, about a month ago now and said, hey, I love the show and I really love to do something for you. I want to send you an X belt. So I, I never heard of it. And I said, um, okay, the, some kind of duty belt. He's like, yeah, it's really cool. I wear it. Um, you're going to love it. So he sent it to me. I've been wearing it for the last month and I have to give the guy a shout out. Um, it's He's on uh, Instagram at uh, ec, uh, at the underscore X underscore belts. He makes them by hand, police officer himself. And the coolest thing about it, if you're a cop or security or you have to wear a duty belt, um, it's got a little like three inch section of kind of stiff bungee material. So when you sit down and flex, the duty belt will give a little bit. It's, it's really, really comfortable. Uh, and the underbelt that comes with it does the same, has the same setup. Velcro's on, no keepers needed. It's a really cool belt. So thank you, Jake, for that. And thank you, X-Belts. Uh, I've really been enjoying it. So go check them out. Um, yeah. Oh, the other thing I got to do, guys, because I, I said I would do this uh, like a month ago, and I did do it one time, but I need to keep it up. I want to read some uh, recent reviews because the five-star reviews are are huge to me, huge to the show. I really appreciate them rolling in. We're up to 888 reviews. Love to get to a thousand, as you guys know. So I'm going to read the last four, as promised, uh, about a month ago. So the last one came in from uh, Roll More Futo. I'm guessing he's a uh, jujitsu guy. I enjoy the casual demeanor Steve has, and the quality of the guests is excellent. Keep it up. Agree, hundred percent. Thank you, sir. Um, then Patrick Bagwell, five stars, says the stories that definitely helped me fuel the motivation to be in law enforcement. I'll be putting in my application as soon as they open up. That's awesome to hear. I love to hear the shows uh, inspired someone to to get into law enforcement. Then we have Living Five Seventeen, five stars. Uh, never fails to get my never fails to arrest my attention. Currently, a uh, cadet in the Belet in North Carolina must be like the some part of the testing phase. I was seeking a podcast to soak in as much info as possible about law enforcement, and this podcast has not failed. The stories and experiences I've heard on this podcast have shed more light on why I'm becoming an LEO. I'm encouraged and emboldened by the content and wisdom shared here is invaluable. I encourage everyone, every aspiring LEO to listen to this podcast faithfully. Thanks, Steve, for the time and energy you put in. Cody. Thank you, Cody. I appreciate that. Next, we have five stars. Uh, the title's amazing from Venezuelan God. My fiance has tried to get me into podcasts for the longest time. This and street cop training is something I listen to every single day. Keep up the con, keep up, keep going with the content. Thank you. So, thank you guys for those five star views. I truly appreciate it. If you send some this way, I will read them on the show. And we did, by the way, have um, Dennis Benino, Benigo from Street Cop street cop training on the podcast. It was a fun interview. So go check that out when you got a moment. But today, today we have my old boss from LAPD backgrounds. He was Maywood police department retired there uh, as a sergeant. He was uh, undercover in narcotics and intelligence. JJ was um, one of my favorite bosses I've ever had. The kind of guy that gave you the leash and just wanted it to get done. As long as the product was good, JJ was cool with that. So and I knew nothing about backgrounds. <laughs> I came from a state that didn't even have posts. So 
Backgrounds varied. You go to a big city, extremely in-depth background. You go to the country in Massachusetts, the Western Mass, almost no background. So it was a struggle for me, but JJ, Pat Buchanan, Ken Roybal all uh, helped me get acclimated. So I'm very happy to bring on JJ Williams. JJ! Hey, what's happening, brother? What's going on, man? Long overdue having you come on. I remember when I when I got to backgrounds, you were what they call a B2. It was like a lead investigator, right. like a, like a right. team leader. And you had this little office on the side of the kind of the big bullpen area. And, uh, you know, you were like a sports jersey, jeans, whatever. You were kind of like real laid back, um, <laughs> busting my chops immediately about the Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh God, well, I'm a Steeler fan. Yeah, you had That's Steeler it. stuff everywhere. And then not long after I got there, you got promoted to like the um, supervisor spot. And then all of a sudden JJ's wearing a suit and a tie and we're like, oh man, <laughs> yeah. JJ's gone yeah, legit. Part, yeah. He's gone legit. But I always appreciated that because you took it serious. You know, it wasn't like you weren't going to come in and not be professional. Now you're, now you're a guy that's got to go to these meetings and all this stuff. So, um, I appreciate what you did for me at backgrounds. Uh, it was a blast being there. And it's a chapter of my life. We'll never forget. It, it, it was, it was a fun time. You guys, we had a great core group of guys. Absolutely. I mean, it was just, we just, uh, blended well and, you know, going after work, having beers, talking, it just, you know, brought back old days of being a cop choir practicing and just hanging out with the guys. It was, it was good. It was Hell really yeah. good. Oh, you got to tell yeah. me. Uh, I think about this sometimes. Uh, if I ever go through a drive through and get a burger, you and I oh. and the guys, we all went out to uh, like a local brewery nearby. And then you gave me a yeah. ride home, gave me a ride home because I used to take the train. You're like, I'll give you a ride. So we went um, on the way home. We were driving. You look at me and you're like, have you ever, I think, was it Carl's Jr.? No, oh, Tommy's. Tommy's. Tommy <laughs> you go, have yeah. you ever had a Tommy's? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. You're like, that's it. We're going. So we pull in. You bought me, we bought these giant hamburgers and French fries. I think it was like 40 bucks for the two hamburgers and drinks. <laughs> Man, that was, those were so good. Oh yeah. They're chili burgers. It's, it's what we always called it growing up uh, drunk fast food. Yeah. So when you're drunk, you eat that to sober yourself up and make a mess. <laughs> kind of like it you did. It was all over your shirt. And I ruined my work shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just good. I mean, uh, yeah, you, I mean, if you go to LA, you got to have, you know, in and out, you got to have Tommy's. Yeah, man. Tommy's was great. Yeah. That, that was, um, I really feel like I was there at a good time cause I, I was there for two years and at the end, like we lost, you know, we lost people and, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, you eventually left, Ken left, um, the, the, it's, things got wonky. Like I, I got right, right there when it started to, to kind of fall apart and started. So to me, it was like, I was drinking from a fire hose. I didn't know any of this stuff anyways, but you guys were telling me like, yeah, we're kind of losing our grip on, uh, kind of working. Oh uh, yeah. It's just the, you left at a really good time. I feel, you know, I feel bad with, um, the people, the last two years were really difficult, uh, working there because that's when everything shifted the, uh, protest against law enforcement, the whole yeah. COVID, um, and you know, all this movement with the woke and, um, fighting to keep the standards and guidelines in place was difficult because the people I was fighting was LAPD themselves. I mean, they were trying to bring in, uh, documented gang bangers, uh, crack dealers, uh, well, they needed, they had to work. It's like they could have, they could have got a job at McDonald's or, yeah. or Home Depot, but not selling crack. And it's just that frustration and arguing with no backup. I mean, when you were there, we had Ralph and Tom and me in those meetings. Then when Ralph left, it was Tom and I. Then when Tom left, it was just me alone in these meetings. And it was, it was real difficult. A lot of stress involved, um, which, which lost, I lost all my hair because of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it was, it was hard. It was hard to stand the ground in, you know, you know me, I, I don't budge when it's the right call. Right. I'm not going to do it just because they want it or want this person in uh, based on their skin color or, you know, if they were an athlete, a professional athlete, if you didn't meet the criteria, you didn't meet the criteria. And right. I would fight the battles and it get, it got harder and harder with nobody else uh, being supportive in there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, towards the end, I got a, I got candidates that were arrested 
by crowd control for not dispersing at um, like Michael Brown protests. Mm -hmm. And I to me, it was like, see you later. Don't want yeah. you. You know, I, I know I understand you had this change of heart the last six months, but we need a little time for that yeah, to, well, to set in. And then it, it was like, no, that this person's the right color. So mm -hmm. we're, we're going to keep them like it. And it wouldn't be someone at your level. It would be someone, you know, up the rung that was like they're staying oh, in. And that was that was the hard part because the people I was arguing against were all above me, above way above my pay grade. They were the tops. I mean, I was arguing with my own bosses, uh, the people that run uh, the public uh, safety division and personnel, people that run the hiring in LAPD. JJ, can you take us um, way back to a young okay. James Williams uh -oh. uh, on the job? The first call you uh -oh. can remember that like really got your blood going that made you think, oh man, this is for real. Wow. Foot pursuit. <laughs> um, it was, uh, my first foot pursuit was a disaster. Um, you know, cause you're wearing all this equipment, you got your baton cause they're instructed. You got to wear a baton, you got your radio, yeah. you're running. Um, first I fell out of the car cause my, the seatbelt wrapped around my gun and, <laughs> you know, that's I, happened to me. I was in training. So the TO was driving and I was the trainee. So and I always wore a seatbelt even back then. And when I when I undid the seatbelt, you know, it retracted, but it wrapped around my revolver handle. So I flung the door open and whap right to the ground I got. <laughs> face planted. And I'm sitting there trying to and now I'm like hanging in midair. You know, mm -hmm. it, you know, my ass is facing upward and I'm trying to get, I had to undo, unholster the gun, unwrap it. Then Tio's gone. I mean, he's, he's foot pursuit. Well, right. I was fast. So I ended up passing him and he's a slow old white boy. So <laughs> I pass his ass and I'm running now, batons flying. I was like, what the hell do I do? Do I stop and get it? My radio goes flying. I was like, holy shit, I'm losing all my <laughs> Yard stuff. sale. Yeah. So finally I catch the guy, tackle, and we get him in and the whole time, I guess my T.O. saw everything flying. So he's picking shit up as we're going. So my jacket I took off during the foot pursuit, not realizing my badge is on my jacket because Vernon, they only gave us one badge. And you had to take it off your uniform, put on whatever the outer layer was, right. which was my jacket. Well, I had thrown that off during the foot pursuit. <laughs> so uh, he comes up to me and he says, kid, I think you lost a lot of your stuff here, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> So after that, I never carried a baton. I had held the posse box from sliding across the seat. So, um, and I just, you know, carried a flashlight in my sap pocket when yeah. I got out of the car. I just tuck it in there, and it never came out during a foot pursuit, even hopping fences and stuff. So, yeah, you got that long uh, pocket in the back. Yeah, yeah. So I ditched the old baton. I felt it was better used. I, I think batons are like the worst worst tool uh, uh, that we get because I've got hit more with the baton uh, than the suspect <laughs> has. Maybe they didn't like me or something, but I don't know. I just think cops get hit and hurt more with the baton than the suspect does. Yeah. Now that we have the taser, I just, I keep the taser and then I keep my baton in my duty bag. And then that's for like, if you have to smash a window or something, or if you're going yeah, to one I, when it's a fight, you just put it in your back pocket, you know, but like I'll you said, it's like, it's a pain. The flashlight was the, the greatest thing because it's low key. People can't see it. You hold it in the middle and you just, you know, snap of the wrist. You get somebody's attention. Um, you know, we used to carry saps before they, the department rolled those yeah. out. Uh, we tried sap gloves, then they rolled those out. <laughs> but, those are like um, the armored knuckle gloves? The yeah, oh, those man. were great. Man. Bad optics. <laughs> talk about the old days, man. That was great. Um, yeah, so I didn't, you know, we didn't have pepper spray back then. We had maize, and I didn't like carrying maize because my Asian eyes would seal up with it, so I would blind immediately. Yeah, same with my so, Irish eyes, man. Yeah, and we didn't have tasers back then, so I figured if I couldn't, you know, physically beat the guy down and to get him into cuffs, then um, I was going to shoot him. Right. So, <laughs> Dude, I hear, I hear similar stories from um, – I used to work on Cape Cod, and there was an old-timer I was chatting with, and – there was almost a foot pursuit then there wasn't. And I was chatting with him and he said, you know, 25 years ago, and this is probably 15 years ago when I first started, um, 
like the belts, everything would move. Like you had those big gray radios. They were heavy. Then you had the full baton. He said, I was chasing a guy in my whole duty belt. He had one of those like hinge, hinge pancake holsters that, you know, LAPD has sometimes. He said the whole thing rotated and then his heel hit the holster. He said, he's going to grab the guy and he sees his revolver go up over the guy's head. He's like, Oh yeah, those old clamshells, they were notorious for flying open in foot pursuits. And they still have those in LA. Times, I, I've seen revolvers slide by me during the pursuit. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it just I mean, equipment has come a long way. You know, those those old vests that we had to wear. Uh, oh, yeah, it, it actually it actually saved me one time uh when I broke my back. I didn't realize it was broken between the the stiffness of the Sam Brown and the stiffness of the vest that kept my back straight. So. Kept you together. Yeah. What's that? It kept you together. Like, yeah, know. it did. It did. It kept me erected until I went to the station to write the report and couldn't get up. But um, yeah, it was, it was a fun era. Uh, we were, our area, the Southeast area of Los Angeles County was like the last of the old school cowboy area. Um, we depended on all the other small departments around us with mutual aid. We were very, very close knit with all the other departments and it was fun. It was a fun time. Uh, leaving Vernon, which is all industrial. That's where like farmer John's is Hoffies, all the meat packing places. Right. Like I got more shootings there than anywhere. Cause we we're too busy shooting loose steers when they get away from the, <laughs> the butchering plants. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I had what three shootings in one day when eight of them got out. So damn, get but, some steaks uh, from that or what? Hey, you owe me some. No, I wish <laughs> I wish, uh, back in the day, right before I got there, they used to call this, uh, old cowboy and he'd come down and lasso them and bring them back and they'd pay him a thousand dollars. You know, so because once you shoot them and the lead gets in there, then they donate it to Alpo, which was in the city and becomes dog food. It almost like is Alpo letting these cows out? <laughs> just yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. We had nine break loose one day and it was it was a free for all in that whole area. And we had we carried slugs uh, in our units specifically for the steers because nothing else is dropping them. You're so, kidding because you know, I've been to these places that that's the city. There, where are the mm-hmm. where are the cows just in behind in the? No, they go. We had seven butchering uh, places, meat packing places. So there. they bring them in there, there kill them, and chop them up. Yeah, yeah. And this truck, the floorboard came through, and it was on one of the major streets, and uh, nine of them got out and uh, started running amok, and they were got into the other cities. They were just driving alongside of them, plugging them with the 45s or nines, just shooting away and <laughs> double up bucks. And if you've never seen a steer um, running freely and wild, it's truly the my, well, the first time we trapped them. You had to turn your light. We go through a whole training with this. You had to turn your light bars off so that they don't get, you know, uh, pissed. Yeah. And I mean, they, this one looked and just charged our units and leaked and went over and took the uh, light bar off the top of the unit, but it cleared the unit. And we were like, oh shit, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> Cause you have to have a backdrop, uh, you know, before you can shoot. Over. Right. Oh yeah. Um, before you shoot yeah, an ounce of lead at uh, 1500 feet per second into the city. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, uh, and you had to shoot the, the slugs in a certain area on the shoulder, you know, to drop them. And um, it was funny. Then once we got him re-lined up, the sar- <laughs> sergeant started, he wanted to take the shot. And you hear this, bam, zoom, missed him. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Well, he's got the shotgun laying on the roof of the unit. And the, the it's skimming across the roof of the unit. Oh. <laughs> They're wild. <laughs> so it's going high every time. So he had three shots, three streaks on the roof. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, yeah. So we're like, okay, Sarge, no more. We're, 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 it's a one-shot kill system here. But, uh, <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. We, it, yeah, it was fun there, but I got into, you know, working informants, working dope, and uh, the city was very political because it was mob run. Um, but they didn't like me catching truckers bringing in kilos of coke. <laughs> so they kind of frowned upon that. Hey, you know, the trucker companies are very supportive. It's like that, their drivers are bringing in the dope, not me. Yeah, right. So I, tra- I transferred to the city next door, which was Maywood. And it was a, 
it was a shock as, you know, two years on at Vernon, your senior, two years on at Maywood, the average seniority at Maywood when I got there was 20 plus years. That wow. was the average senior. Yeah, exactly. So they looked at the snot nosed kid. I barely got, you know, talking to or spoken to. I mean, um, and you have to prove yourself the on these calls. Yeah, it just, and it was and such Maywood a small was like, like, one square mile, but like 25,000 people, and a half. right? It was one and a half square miles of 40,000 people. That's insane. So it too, is. Too much humanity. Some these, well, some of these lots, you know, they're like a quarter acre deep. Um, and there's apartment complexes up and down. So you get into those lots, you're surrounded by 20, 30 people immediately. So, you know, you had to clear these gang parties by yourself. <laughs> so you didn't have backup and you rode, you know, Lincoln cars, one man units. Um, and if you had a shooting, you handled it yourself. You collected all the evidence. You did your own fingerprints. We had CSI kits in the back of the units. Uh, really? You were, oh, yeah. You, you handled everything. The only times you called in the detective, you had a name suspect that was out of the city uh, quite a ways out. Um, if it was like the neighboring city, you'd. Go get them. What, what, what was your shift like there? Would, would it be a sergeant, a couple of patrolmen, or? Yep. Yep. That when I started there was a sergeant and two patrolmen. When I left there, Maywood grew. Uh, when I became a sergeant, I'd have anywhere from three to five patrolmen, and okay. sometimes. And then we uh, really expanded reserve program, uh, which helped because then we can ride some uh, Adam units, um, and we'd let those be the free roaming units to work gangs, so or work backup calls. Um, but you know, we, when I came on, that was right after colors came out. So every street had a gang Mm. and every gang wanted to make a name for themselves. So what better way than take out a cop? So we were always taking rounds. They would always try to ambush us and jump us at these calls. Uh, uh, you know, they'd go to a party that they'd want to try to beat you down. So, yeah, you just you you would get tested and you knew it and you knew and you had to pass the test. You just look at the loudest mouth guy and just say, I don't care what happens to me, but you're going to the hospital. That's all you had to keep. And you had to make sure they believe that you're going to the hospital. I'm putting you and your friend right next to you in the hospital. I don't care what happens to me, but I'm beating you down and I'm going to make it hurt and you won't get up. And sometimes they tested. We almost lost a few officers. We had two guys get jumped, witness a stabbing at a party call as they're rolling up to it. And, and it was 18th Street house. And they got trapped behind the apartment complex and confronted with 17. One officer got his baton taken away and cracked. Uh, he had a skull fracture from here all the way down. And he was out. So the other officer, thank God he was big. And roided out, um, worked out all the time <laughs> because that anger paid off. When backup got there, all they saw was bodies flying across the driveway. And they're like, what the hell's going on? It was the officer just throwing people off the down officer. And he had to fight for about 12 minutes by himself before the backup could make their way to him. Damn. So that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, you get many riots going. I mean, you know, you're involved. You, the rule of thumb is you had to keep two extra uh, uniforms for the weekend because you were changing. You are going to get them ripped up or doubts with alcohol. There's no doubt. <laughs> you're, said, getting, you're, you're getting in a scuffle through the weekends. Does you're it sound like there's any it. quiet shifts, really? Um, sometimes there would be like day watch was the quietest because most of the you know, the crackheads uh, would sleep. be sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. They're sleeping or – you know, so um, it wasn't too bad in the days. You know, most of it was running reports, your burn reports, things like that. Your PMs, that's when they, it started getting hectic. The gang bangers were out. You know, graveyard was the fun shift. I, I worked mainly graves. So I'd work two on graves and you had to rotate off. So I'd go to day watch, then come back to graves. Dude, that, two more shifts. That's why I used to do my all my neighborhood checks in the hood in like at 8 a.m. <laughs> Be yeah. like, honey, I gotta yeah, leave. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that way, Abuela answers the door. You know, she's making a nice yeah. soup or something. All the gangsters yeah. are asleep. You want to yeah. come in for some that, soup? No, nah, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, you want to do in hard areas. Yeah, I mean, it never like where I grew up in McKeesport was pretty bad. I mean, it was 
it was always one of the worst towns in Pennsylvania. Um, now I think it's number one on the list. So it never bothered me even when I moved out there. I used to play basketball down in South Central. I'd ride the bus down there, get off at Crenshaw and, and ball in the schoolyard there. Even working the surveillances, I'd get out at Nickerson Garden and ball with the gangbangers watching the door. So it's <laughs> just, uh, you know, it didn't bother me, bother me to fit in there and play ball. You took right and, to it. Yeah, and, you know, I t- tell people I'll watch the door, just, you know, drive by a honk twice if, if – uh, if we have to move, I'm just going to run the court with the guys. And I'd be out there balling because I had long hair. I rode a Mitsubishi Eclipse undercover. So I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, they thought I was a drug dealer rolling through the hood <laughs> anyway. So, so this I Asian guy's in. crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. I mean, you know, back then I played a lot of basketball. So I'd run and, you know, working undercover was, was great because, you know, you, you you would make up different disguises, get out on foot to follow these people. And we had one guy that looked like a homeless guy. He put on his army jacket and it smelled like alcohol and he'd walk around like he was homeless. I feel, like really they used, was I feel like they used to do fun stuff like that a lot more yeah. than they do now. They don't do oh, anything fun oh, anymore. Everything's, everything's a wiretap now. Yeah. You know, back then it was all leg work. We'd follow people. We were notoriously known in the narco community of our surveillance presence. So we would do surveillance for customs, for DEA, for FBI, because that was our forte. We were known for it. We could stay with people, you know, six, seven, eight months following. We did this Crip gang. Uh, even when I promoted, we were still following them. And we, that was two and a half years into it. Um, and they never caught on to us. And, yeah, that's a wild story there. Um, but we we got to see a lot. You know, it was the beginning of the whole narco trade, uh, the agreements with Pablo with the U.S. government to launder money, and right. it was it was all of that, and it was you know um, it was fun. Uh, it, patrol was fun working all the gangs back then, and. And then working as a detective undercover was a blast. Yeah, it man, blast. It sounds like fun. Do you have any um, strange or bizarre stories from being undercover? <laughs> Partying with uh, the major player uh, we were following, yeah. <laughs> really? We, yeah. So my part, because before... You're only the, allowed to have two beers, know, that's what I hear. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> we were drunk off our ass. Um, <laughs> So the, the old school way of thinking, you had to have, you know, 15 years on before you could make it to narco. And it was all old white guys. Well, they couldn't get around. So when the Mexicans and the, the Colombians got smart first, they stopped using flashy cars. They were using, you know, the Toyotas, the Nissans that fit in every area. Sure. The Mexicans were really smart. They hid within their own area. So Maywood Bell, uh, Huntington Park, Linwood, Southgate, that was all Sinaloan Mexicans and Paramount. So that that's where they would hide. They'd hide all their dope and money there and pay the neighborhood to watch it for them. So we had to really be, get innovative. So they started asking for people to sign up uh, for overtime when they started this dope crew. And, you know, all these guys were old and, and had families. I was this young buck kid that wanted to make money. So I signed up and got onto the team and they used the hell out of us young kids because we could get out on foot with these guys. Yeah. These molds are all young. So we can go into clubs with them. We can go into restaurants with them. So we go into this restaurant bar in Downey and we go to the bar and my partner is white, but he speaks fluent Spanish. So he's wearing the, the uh, transmitter. And he's on the right side of me, the crook's on the left side. And this guy's a major payer. He's a Felix uh, from the Felix uh, Ariano uh, cartel. So he's the nephew, and we're following him in, and we're talking, and all of a sudden he turns to me and says, hey, what you drinking? And it's like, uh, you know, tequila. He buys me a shot and a beer, and we're drinking. And he's and the whole time he's setting up the deal with the guy next to him, and my partner's relaying the information over the wire about uh, eight beers down and four shots down. Ooh. We're like hogging up on this guy. He's trying to tell us what he's doing. And I actually I like mean, this he, guy. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, we're his best friends. And, and the whole time, you know, it's all, everything's over the wire. I mean, he's transmitting everything. 
And he's not shy about it. He's telling us, yeah, I'm here to make a deal with this guy. You guys into it? You need anything? I, I set you up. I can hook you. I'm like, no, no, we're just here. You know, we're going through town. We're not even from here. And so we come stumbling out of this bar. And my sergeant looks at us and says, what the fuck? Give me your keys. You are not driving. <laughs> <laughs> we were tossed. So, uh yeah, we ended up passing out in some other police uh, uh, undercover unit. <laughs> so hey, you, gotta, you, you do what it takes, right? Oh, yeah. No, and, and you do. We had some of the best undercover uh, uh, UCs that ever worked. One of them became famous. Um, I won't use his name because he's still on the job. But um, the he started dressing like them in his shirt. Uh, we used to name the suspects because of the type of shirt this guy was wearing is, and we'd say his name, oh, he's got a blank shirt on. And it became known through the narco world and people would use it in their warrants. Oh yeah. The crook was, we knew it was a crook cause he was wearing this blank shirt and it was, it was this guy's name the whole time. <laughs> Nobody knew they thought it was a brand of a shirt. It wasn't, it was his last name. <laughs> so, That's funny. Yeah. But some of the guys were so talented. Like, one of the guys, Dickie, he, just by the demeanor, he can tell what part of uh, South America they were from or Mexico. Just by their demeanor, their body language, that's how good uh, some of these guys were. He could tell you if they were Colombian, if they were Cuban. Um, some of them could tell you just by getting into a car, looking at their music, what part of Mexico they're from. Yeah. So we we got really into it, um, and the you know the intelligence arena was built up all around us uh, with that, with the military. You know, we were the guinea pigs on all of that, which was fun. It was also nerve wracking. Did you guys ever you go know, into Mexico? No, we weren't allowed to go in there. But my chief Maywood was an amazing guy. He, he was another uh, great influence in, in me as a person. But he worked nine years for the CIA undercover as a Mexican federal colonel. So, wow. yeah, so he, he had a lot of contacts down there. He was the informant for Nikki Camarillo. Uh, he's the one that made the calls down there and said, we need to know where the body is. Bring him to us. Um, so we would use him and his contacts for intelligence purpose. We couldn't use it in the warrant, of course. But um, we would use him to, to help us uh, get around, you know, get information around down there to find out, you know, we had a huge air smuggling case is the largest. It's probably still going on. Who knows? We were tracking 38 airplanes with satellites and air wax, yeah. air, uh, you know, a planes. And it was, it was an interesting time because, you know, the whole time we had no idea what we were doing because we're new to this. So, you know, well, what year is this, JJ? The what? airport case started in 94. The whole big uh, turnaround when we did the Silmar bus was 89, September of 89. And that was the only time in the dope world where we actually affected it. So the price of the kilo when we did the Silmar bus was 11000 It went to 33000 after. It, um, it was the last time they stored major dope uh with money after that they split it um and they wouldn't do more than five tons at a time so it impacted the entire western hemisphere of, of the coke trade yeah uh nobody could get it uh especially if you get out of the uh the la area it was very difficult to get coke at that time so everything changed after that then the intelligence center when the movie traffic came out kind of ruined the prior intelligence center because they disclosed it in traffic. So ironically, the military under Clinton, um, he lowered the defense budget and he shifted every penny of it to law enforcement. <laughs> and what it was, was we now had access. We, it, they didn't like get rid of any military people. They just invited us law enforcement and used the money towards law enforcement say, law enforcement and military. What is, so what is the military, um, sorry to interrupt you, what is the military allowed to do on American soil while working with police? Like, like what are, like, you know what I mean? Because they're not supposed to operate really, but 
So how were they helping you with surveillance, technology, air Maybe stuff? They become part of the task force, so they can operate on U.S. soil. Okay. So, yeah, it's just none of the feds really knew how to go after these uh, these major dealers because they couldn't fit in. All of them were college. They'd show up with their sweaters tied around their necks and their U.S. made cars with tinted windows and a telephone yeah. antenna. On Who's for tennis? And- yeah, so they didn't fit in right. because the, the the crooks were hiding the dopes in the low income areas because they can pay the people off. The, if they were hiding in Beverly Hills, these guys would be perfect. So that's why they would use us locals. Plus, we had the local laws. Um, most of your cases w- went through pro- local prosecution. Very few would go federal, but they wanted the money. So they would join our task forces and form big task forces. And the bigger the task force, the worse it got. And that's why we removed ourselves from LA Impact. We were more successful being a smaller task force, and we get bigger proceeds from it. it yeah, is, the chief gets money. more money. You, yeah, yeah, Maywood made $3.2 million off the Silmar bust. So the, all the dope bust and the money we obtained paid my salary. I was the highest paid in our department for 40 straight years. So, um, you know, because of all the overtime, but you know, that money went a long way. It got us, we were the first agency to mount MP five machine guns next to our shotguns. So we had high and low band scanners in our units. We could monitor, communicate with the feds. We had for such a small agency, we had top of the line units. You know, and all of that was paged through thank you cartel. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know they. Um, I know the feds put that in there because we deal with that around here, and it's, you know, because um, city managers and and mayors immediately, of course, wanted the money. Put that in the gen- right. put that in the general fund. Well, that's illegal. The chief of police yeah, gets it. He gets a checkbook to that yeah. account, and he can buy things for the department. Just police, because that right. was the first. The first problem was the mayor wanted the money. Like, oh, great. Well, yeah, and, and that was the problem. So so what they started doing is just cutting the, the, the PD budget and letting them use the money from the dope to pay. But, like, every unit had two raid vests in it. Um, we put our officers through entry, soft entry training. Um, you know, because of the MP5s, we can do that. And it, it actually paid off. We, we had one of the Felix uh, nephews in town um, – he just got done doing a shootout in Phoenix, and uh, he killed two, um, I think it was one Phoenix cop and uh, one DEA agent and wounded two others, and his brother was captured. But he had to go to his, uh, his niece's quinceanera, so, which happened to be in Maywood. Uh, so we called the units down there, and my buddy was uh, the sergeant on duty, and I said, Lou, whatever you do, don't confront this guy because he will have a shootout. So what's Lou do? He pulls the guy over, but, and interviewing this gentleman, we're like, why didn't you shoot? He said, well, I saw the machine guns and I said, we don't have a chance in hell. <laughs> so, Doing their uh, job so the already. Off. Yeah. He, did. he said, if they had shotguns and handguns, he would have shot them. He would have had a shootout cause he knows he can, he can win. Cause they'll always, he always told us they'll focus on, on the back window and I'm not going to be anywhere near that. Yeah. So, but with the machine gun, he didn't want to take a chance. And he saw all the officers with machine guns. He gave up. So yeah, good. So they did pay off. Yeah. Now with DoorDash, you can get your Starbucks go-tos delivered right to you. Early morning meeting? Treat yourself to a breakfast sandwich. Scored the winning point? Celebrate with a cold brew. Feeling exceptionally awesome? <laughs> Keep doing you. Your usual is on the way. Coffee delivery makes every moment worth celebrating. So come on, make your day. Starbucks delivery now available on DoorDash. Tap the banner to order now. Menu limited. See the DoorDash app for details. JJ, um, can you tell tell us about the most intense or terrifying moment in your career? Ooh, my partner's death. Uh, he was killed on duty. And I worked day watch shift with him all the time. And then when I promoted, um, you know, we'd hang out after work, after work firing, drinking. We're still good friends. That morning we had breakfast together. I turned him on to my favorite breakfast of chili cheese dog with onions. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we shared that that morning and we had just got off of a big case, did a big bus. So we were kind of laying low or, and then 
um, our sergeant, uh, Freeze, kicked us loose early. He says, go home. Nothing's going on. They're going to file the case. Just go home and, you know, do whatever. Go clean your guns. So I left our office, which was probably about a mile away from the Maywood uh, City Hall, and it left at 1.30. And for some reason, I turned the, the police radio off. Um, never did before. And and I went through Maywood, my normal route to go home. And and the call went out at one thirty two. I was in the heart of Maywood at one thirty, And that would have put me maybe just as close as John to the call or a couple blocks further than John when he jumped on the call. Um, and, you know, I was undercover. I had my famous Mitsubishi Eclipse. I had a full automatic MP5 by my side. They would have never seen me coming. And he rolled up. It was a planned um, takeover robbery at a liquor store that had uh, over 300,000, about 380,000 they had brought in to do pay check cashing for a lot of the workers from Vernon. Okay. And so there was five robbers plus one of the kids that uh, tipped them all off to this worked inside at the liquor store. So as John comes up, he sees three guys running from the store with handguns. So instinct kicks in. Well, those are the robbers. Three guys, handguns, 211 silent, 211's robbery for us out here in Cali. So he starts chasing them. He guns the unit. They get, He gets right by the store. They turn and start firing at his unit. He stops, gets out, unholsters his gun. Two more come out from the store. And assassinate him. Three shots, last shot, head shot, point blank, and his gun dropped onto the floor, and he slumped halfway in, halfway out. And my pager was blowing up. You need to come in. You need to uh, head up the investigation. So I got there. The, the detective sergeant that was his best friend, and I could see it in his eyes, the pain, and he just when I got on. <laughs> little humor of all this, ironically, is that's when Bush was in town for his campaign, uh, senior, when he was running uh, against Clinton. Right. And so I threw all of my equipment into my personal car. I had a hopped up 5.0 Mustang because I knew I'm going to get there a lot faster in that than the undercover car. And uh, because it was a fast, very fast Mustang. Um. But the free, I get to the freeway and it's all shut down. The trippers have it all blocked. So I badged the, the motor, the motorcycle tripper cop, the highway patrol, California highway patrol. And he's like, oh shit, Maywood. He says, give me one minute. So he runs back to the bike, comes back to me. He said, and this other motor pulls up. He says, follow us. So he starts going to Maywood. I mean, I lived literally six miles away from the city. I lived in a town called Alhambra. So we're blowing, and my car can go a lot faster than his bike, so I'm on their ass. Like, come on, move it. And they're riding these KZ-1000s. They're topped out at 120, and we go blowing by George Bush's motorcade on the 710 freeway. Oh, man. So, yeah, his Air Force One is at Long Beach Airport, and he's headed back down there from L.A., and we go blowing by him, code three. <laughs> and we're like this long freaking, uh, you know, entourage and convoy, and it was him, and so we get off on, and they flagged me by them as we got off the freeway. And that's when I rolled in. And um, he was still laying there. Uh, the coroner hadn't come yet. Oh, and uh, they were still waiting for the coroner to show up. So it was hard. It was, I had to take over the investigation. I told the detective sergeant, I said, Ed, just go home with your wife, hug her. Uh, if anything comes up, um, I'll let you know. And, we ran through 534 leads within 20 hours and came up with nothing. We had nothing. So the next morning, um, we get a call. Uh, some FBI agents call and said, some keep, kid keeps calling saying he knows who killed your officer. So I told him, well, we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. So he says, all right, I'll bring him in. Uh, this kid was part of the crew, and he's rolling on him. And we had a backup video. The owners of the store had two video systems. The crooks went after the first one, so we knew it was an inside job. And the second one, nobody knew about except for them. And the whole robbery, uh, the shadow of the police unit was, you could see on the video too, 
uh, when he came by. So he identified everybody. So we work in the task force. I called up our groups. So we had probably about 400 officers uh, and detectives work in this, uh, two L- both uh, SIS LAPD squads, uh, two SWAT teams, two SEB teams, which is LA Sheriff's version of SWAT. LA Impact donated all four of their groups, uh, two on standby, two to do the work. Um, each group had two surveillance teams, so we had uh, four surveillance teams running with that. We had Long Beach's Berg, Compton's Berg, Compton surveillance team. We had DEA surveillance teams donated. Everybody came forward. Wow. He was the cop after the riots. Um, and when we put out the final teletype, when – we found out that it was pre-planned. It was premeditated. We found a roll of film that we developed, and they literally planned the entire robbery on this big box. Each side of the box was a different frame. They showed how the police, if they came, how three people would run the, from the store and get them past the store, engage them in a gun battle, so the other two would come out and assassinate the cop. So when we put out the final teletype, do you know what a teletype system is? I mean, we have like um, the old system of communicating for police was a teletype. It was like a very small printer that uh, you you basically was a typewriter machine. You type the teletext and it was sent out to all law enforcement agencies. Oh, so kind of like know. a G, like a general broadcast or like a bolo or something. Right, right. Be way before computers and right. you know, all the digital stuff. So when we put out the final teletype on it how this robbery occurred that whoever showed up was dead because your instincts to chase the, the crook um, or in this case, the three crooks. Um, so everybody knew they were going to, it was, it, you were going to die rolling on a call. So it was the largest law enforcement contingency for a funeral until Randall Simmons from LAPD, the SWAT guy, there was uh, over 6,800 police units from around the country, as far as Texas, Denver, Colorado, uh, Washington State. Um, and, you know, we worked with a lot of these agencies that sent police down. Um, like just the motor uh, motorcycle procession was over 1,000 bikes. Wow. So, you, you got yeah, all the guy, every guy or, or we got three of the five initially, the worker, uh, we picked up immediately. Um, so we did surveillances and, you know, of four days we couldn't find the other two. So we figured they already hit the border and fled. So we took everything down. Uh, our goal was to get them in custody before John was buried. And the whole time I, I didn't sleep. My partner and I, we worked five straight days with no sleep and it was all coffee and adrenaline. Um, and it was, it was hard. Uh, then, then finally got four hours of sleep after the, the arrests were taken and all the paperwork was done. Then we had to do the funeral and, uh, that was hard. That was really, really difficult. Um, uh, Hoagie, it was his nickname. Um, oh, I see. I see you on Facebook that you, you get once yes. a year you go there. Yeah, we, we get there every year. A bunch of us. Um, we, I feel bad. I feel guilty that I shut off my radio. I honestly believe I could have probably saved him. Um, or you could so have it, killed yourself. Yeah, but you know what? Like most of us, I'd rather it be me than him. He. Yeah. At the time, he had him kids. He had two daughters, um, but you know, it's hard to live with that guilt yeah. of the unknown. Um, and people say, "Oh, you know, it was God telling you it wasn't your time." But well, maybe it could have prevented his time from happening as well. Right. So, um, you know, I'll have a long talk with him after after my departure of this fine earth, but. Uh, <laughs> right. It, it was it was rough. It was the hardest uh, time to do an investigation um, because it's your friend. Yeah, I and you imagine, had to, man. yeah, and you had to keep you know your mind on the police work aspect of it, which was really difficult. Um, you know, because it is a friend, it is your drinking buddy, and um, he, he was just such a good guy. And we didn't know he was a multimillionaire too. <laughs> 
Uh, he had investments up the yin yang. Good and, for him. Uh, well, good. His family's yeah, taken care of then. They, they are. And this last time um, that we went uh, this past year, uh, last year, 2022 was the 30th anniversary. I got to meet his, uh, his fiance from back then. I hadn't seen her since the funeral. And so it was, it was nice to, uh, you know, see her, uh, cause John was so happy. John went through a, a rough spell. Um, and we got really, really tight. He had two DUIs. So he lost his license, thought he wasn't going to be a cop. And I watched him carry his revolver from the locker room. And I, I couldn't be around the station to pick up like my paycheck or anything during regular business hours. Cause I was undercover. I wasn't in any police photos there hanging in the station or anything. Right. So I stopped there one night to pick up my paycheck and I see him walking out after his PM shift carrying his gun. He never carried off duty ever. And he's carrying his patrol gun, which that thing never left his holster unless he was going to be in a shootout. Right. And um, he's like, what are you doing? He was going to off himself because he was, he wanted to be a, he was an accountant by trade. Um, and that's why he did some good investments and made a lot of money, but he loved, just absolutely loved being a cop. And if you couldn't be a cop, you didn't want to live. So I talked to the chief, uh, the next day and, and he says, don't worry, he's, he's going to be the highest paid dispatcher for a year to get his license back. So, and that's that's what he did. And his, he met this lady, he was going to marry her and, um, they had plans to get married that June and he, he was killed, you know, May 29th, 1992. Man, I'm sorry, bro. That's that, that is the nightmare for any police officer. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was hard. I mean, you know, it's brings tears all the time to me. Um, you know, especially when we all get together at the graveside and sure. I, comical thing happened after the funeral. So when I was a boot, And, you know, as the boot, you have to go get the beer for the choir practice. Well, I learned to drink the white man beer Coors Light um, (laughs) because that was the predominant beer for choir practice. But John, he had to have a six pack of Bud. So I always had to buy the frickin six pack of Bud. And John was known. He's the only frickin person that drank Budweiser. So we'd go on these desert trips and it was the Maywood desert trip where guys would go out to the desert for four days and just have fun. We'd blow up stuff. Camp and guns. shoot and all that. Yeah. And the chief chief backed us. Like for the riots, we were out there and we had to take, my partner and I, we had to take all of our takedown equipment. So we had our full automatic MP5s out there, our raid vests. And he made a deal or made arrangements with San Bernardino sheriffs to pick us up. If shit hit the fan, they'd pick us up in their helicopter and fly us back. So we had this Huey land at our campsite and they take off. They come back with their fifty cal gun. That's <laughs> so, sweet. Oh, it was great. But uh, you know, of course, John had butt out there, and the rest of us are drinking our cores light. And so we're there after the funeral, hugging each other, and we hear this weird humming noise. And this, mm, we're like, what the hell is this noise? And this is right after you know the the bagpipes went down the hill uh, yeah. with amazing grace. We're all crying <laughs> and this humming noise. And we're looking around, looking around. Budweiser blimp flies right over us. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> no shit. We're thinking there's freaking hoagie right there. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. So that was, that was a good sign um, that he's okay. That's awesome. So, yeah. JJ, yeah. We're, at, we're at about an hour. I won't keep you too much longer. I do have one, um, one more question for you. It's um, a popular <laughs> one. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people who listen to the podcast. It's one of the best emails I get when someone says they hear you guys talk about your experiences and it motivates them to be a Mm -hmm. police officer. Um, So what advice could you give to a new officer or or a candidate who's applying to be a police officer? What would you tell them? (laughs) Um, Well, always be careful. Um, When you apply, if they're applying and starting, just be honest. And, you know, like we always talked about it, be open and honest. Um, roll the dice because what's going to DQ you nine times out of 10 is dishonesty. Right. We, and whatever you're trying to hide may not hold you back. Might not DQ honest, you, but you DQ yourself with the lie. We, I used to tell all the candidates when I talked to them, I did a monthly talk upstairs 
And I tell them, our, our investigators don't DQ you. You de- disqualify yourselves for the right. way you lived or your lies. Um, so don't disqualify yourselves, first of all, as a candidate. Second, when you're on the job, just watch your back. Know there's cameras around. It's a different um, scenario out there. Um, we were more respected back in the day, more feared. There's no more fear. They People in the public think they can get away with everything, and they're going to try it. Yeah. So you have to be more diligent. You have to be more aware of your surroundings. Um, but just remember, there's cameras. Don't don't be stupid and don't let the emotions get to you. You know, we always had a saying back in the day, once the cuffs went on, the hands went off. So right. um, we, we always live by that motto. And, but, um, you know, just, just watch your back, watch your partner's back. Don't get in over your head. Um, you know, uh, Freeze used to say, if we can't get them today, there's always tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Great words of wisdom right there, man. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. JJ Williams. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. It's been an honor to have you on the show. I'm going to do the outro. Can you hang out for just a couple minutes? We chat after. Sure. Absolutely. All right, brother. Thanks. You're- Ladies and gentlemen, the great JJ Williams, my former boss in undercover narcotics intelligence, uh, Sergeant Maywood police department. Uh, really, really great story. Glad to finally get him on. Uh, I've been talking about it for a long time. So um, really, really pleased that uh, we were able to meet up. Uh, thank you guys for uh, all the all the um, reviews you've been given. I appreciate that. I know I'm like a broken record saying that, but I do truly appreciate it. And now's the time of the show when we thank the Patreon sergeants. Uh, oh, who I'm talking about is Andy Biggs, Greg Gadboy. The great Adam Mihal, Brandon Hooker, Chris June, the great Gary Steiner, Jake Pinedo, John Shoemaker, Lauren Stimson, the handsome Lane Campbell, Seth Wright, William James Long, that's Deputy William James Long to you, James Rose, Tony Fahey, the great Ben Peters, Brandon Walker, Corey Payne, Jason Lau, the great Mike Wynn, Nathan Gowan, Sasha McNabb, Scott Minkler, the great Tammy Walsh, Sean Clifford, just Dennis, because that's all he put. Motor Cop Chronicles podcast. Thank you, sir. George Tessier, Nick News, Scott Young, the great Tom Connell, Wayne Miller, Derek Warden, Burley Boards. That's Dan Carlson, ladies and gentlemen. And Doug and Kelly Newman, thank you all for the support. Thank you for keeping the lights on over here. I truly appreciate it. And uh, I will catch you guys next week. The Coca-Cola Company, Cure Dr. Pepper, and PepsiCo are bringing consumers more choices with less sugar than ever before. From sparkling, flavored, and bottled waters to zero-sugar sports drinks, teas, and sodas, consumers are taking advantage of these choices. In fact, nearly 60% of beverages sold contain zero sugar. To learn more, visit balanceus.org.